I've titled the message tonight, More Like Jesus. How can we be more like Jesus? And we're going to open our Bibles. We're going to go verse, verse by verse through Philippians chapter 12 all the way through Philippians chapter 30. And if we can just kind of take one step as we shared sacrifice and others, we're going to take one step back. And I want to I remind you why the book of Philippians was written because I believe it really applies to middle schoolers today, right? So um, uh, the theme overall is Jesus is everything. And what a great thing to remember through your middle school years. Jesus is everything. Everything in life is about the gospel. And as we continue through Philippians, this is a book about joy, Right? So, so true joy comes from Jesus. True joy comes from Jesus and Jesus alone. Right? And sometimes we have bad days. Maybe we're sad. Maybe we're not too happy. But joy, that inner inside of you, that, that joy comes from Jesus because he is our strength. And here's the thing to remember. Where is Paul at right now when he's writing the book of Philippians? Do you remember from the last couple weeks? He's in prison. Paul's in prison writing a letter, a thank you letter, and he's full of joy. <laughs> How many of you have ever been in time out before? Right? Are you full of joy in time out? Like you've probably done something you shouldn't have done. You're probably like upset, maybe feel like you shouldn't have been disciplined, Right? But you're in time out. Or what about detention? How many of you have ever had detention? Oh, a few less hands there. All right, put your hands down. Right, he's writing a thank you letter. Because the, the church in Philippi sent him a helper and sent him financial support to help him while he's there in prison and the mission he was on. Has anybody ever written a thank you letter? Anybody ever written a thank you letter? Right? Or, or what about supporting a missionary? Has anybody ever supported a missionary? When we bring our missionaries up here and we talk about uh, the Rainers and the work they're doing in Mexico, like has anybody ever helped support a missionary? That's what they did. And that's what Paul received. So he's writing a thank you letter back to thank them. And now in chapter 2, he's going to take some time to encourage, give a little instruction, and we all need a little correction. Right? Do we all need a little correction? Some of you are like, no, I don't need any correction. I'm in middle school. I know what's going on. All right. So uh, now in chapter 2, last week it was the mind of Christ and like Christ's humility. And this week it's going to be on Christ-like character and our response to be more Christ-like. So let's dive into verse 12. Everybody open your Bibles as we read God's word. Chapter 2, verse 12 in Philippians says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This very well could be one of the most impactful and important verses in the New Testament. What we just read is a powerful verse for you and for I. You see, we are not to work for our salvation, but to work out our salvation. And that's a big difference, not working for it, but working out our salvation. Because we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. And Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift, not by works, so that no one can boast. You see, when you accept Jesus into your heart, it's a gift. It's not something you can earn. It's not something you can work for. Let me ask you a question. What is your favorite worst chore that you guys have? How many of you have chores? All right, what's your favorite worst chore that you've ever been given? Cleaning the bathroom. That's a pretty, 
Kitty litter. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's rough. Folding laundry? Okay, I'd rather fold laundry than kitty litter, though. All right, one more. Taking out the trash. All right, listen up. There's some rough chores out there, right? And now how many of you get like some type of reward or get paid for your chores, right? Right, so when I was a kid, you wanna know what my worst chore was? So I loved to mow the yard. That was a chore, I got paid for it, right? My parents, I think I got like 50 cents for spending an hour mowing the yard. But you know what I hated? I hated the dog poop. Oh my goodness, I can't stand it. So I would be mowing the yard like this, like trying to like, not step on it. And I hated the dog poop. And so what any good son would do, listen up, what any good son would do, any good son would say, mom, could you pick up the dog poop for me? And guess what my mom did? She helped me do it because she loved me, right? Now, then I tried to say, well, you ready? Check this one out. What if, what if you have my sister do it for me? I tried to pull a fast one. That was not nice. Anyway, so our chores, we work for it. And we get a reward. We get a gift. Maybe we get, you know, my sons, if they work hard on the house, cleaning it up, mow the yard, clean the pool, right? I'll take them to Chick-fil-A or Dunkin' Donuts, right? And I'll get them some, I'll get them some food for it, like to help them out, to bless them, because they worked for it. But... Let me ask you this. On Christmas, did you work for your gift on Christmas? No. Your parents or a friend or a teacher, right, you get a gift and there's nothing you had to do for it, right? It was a gift and you did nothing for it. And that's, that's what salvation is, right? It's, right it, it's a gift that you receive that you did not have to, to work for. I'm going to share with you, I'm, I'm a dad, And I love giving my kids presents, just like God loves giving us things, good things. So I'm going to share with you right now my most favorite gift I ever gave my kids. I got four teenage boys, all right? And I'm going to show you their favorite gift that they've ever received. Check out the screen. A puppy. Come on, give it up for me. I'm a good dad. I gave my kids a puppy. That's right. Right? My kids didn't have to work for it. Now they have to work for it. They have to work out, right? They have to, they have to take care of the puppy. They have to take, take care of picking up the poop and walking the dog and taking care of the dog, combing the dog, right? They got to take care of the dog. And that's a lot what Paul's saying. That gift of salvation is a gift of grace through faith in Jesus, We do not have to work for it. In John 3.16, you guys all know John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Because God loves you, because God loves us, he sent his son to die on the cross. Jesus bled and died for us, conquering sin and death, rising again the third day for us so that we can have eternal life. He paid the price for our sins, and it's a free gift to you. And now by simply believing, simply accepting Jesus into your heart and saying, God, I'm a sinner. I invite you to live in my heart. I accept that free gift of salvation. We have a relationship with God, and we can live with him forever in heaven when we die. God is always working in you. And once we've prayed to receive Jesus, once we've, we, we've prayed and he's coming to live in our hearts, we are given the Holy Spirit as a helper to live inside of us. You know what the Holy Spirit does, right? When, when he's talking about working out our salvation, the Holy Spirit is working in us to lead us, to guide us, When we don't know what to do, Holy Spirit, lead us, guide us, teach us, train us. You know what? Maybe some of us pray bold prayers saying, challenge me, convict me, change me, help me to be more like Jesus. 
And the reason we can work out our salvation is because God is working in you. God is always working in you. He gives us the desire and ability to obey, to do what he wants us to do. And we can obey. You ready? Here's why you can obey. Listen to this. We can obey because of the power that is in us, right? We can obey because of what Jesus did on the cross, how he conquered sin and death. That same power is available to us to obey God's word and his will for our lives. Working out our salvation means to grow, simply to grow. We call it big words, like we say we're going to the adult sanctuary or the big sanctuary. Sanctification is a big word of meaning to grow. God wants us to grow. How will we grow? You ready? Look at verse 12 again. How will we grow? Through fear and trembling. Anybody know what it means to fear God? To fear God is to take God seriously. Even in this moment, like this is a very holy moment. This is a very serious moment, right? And so God's saying, I want to speak to you, right? And, and I want you to open your heart, right? Some of us are a little distracted. Some of us are a little excited to be here tonight because we're talking, we're having fun, right? But God's saying, this is a holy moment, and I want to speak to you. And fear is to take God seriously. And we honor God with our decisions. And every day, you guys know this, every day we're tested, right? Every day, are we going to choose God's will or are we going to choose our will? Are we going to choose our, the spirit or are we going to choose the flesh? And each day as we choose to follow God, each day as we say no to our flesh, it's building in us a resilience. It's building in us this strength and this increasing desire to simply follow Jesus and obey him and allow him to continue to work in and through us. So where does this motivation to obey God come from? You ready? It's in verse 13. Check it out. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And if there's anything that I want you to learn today, to take away from today, we can follow Jesus and obey him because of what he has done for us. We can follow Jesus and obey him because of what he has done for us. And that's our heart for, for, for why we have middle school ministry here. That's our heart for you in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. We believe God has an incredible plan for you. We believe that God wants to speak to you through his word. We believe that God wants to do this amazing work in and through you. And you may go, well, I'm only in middle school. Well, we're about ready to talk about Timothy, and he was a young man, right? And, and we believe God's got this incredible purpose. You're faced with a lot. You guys hear a lot, see a lot. You, you've experienced a lot. But we believe in the midst of all of that that God wants to work in and through you. He, as you change, as you grow, right? Middle school, you're getting taller, you're getting smarter, right? Your body's changing, you're, you're understanding more, like you're going through physical changes, emotional, spiritual, like everything's changing. Your brain's going crazy right now, right? But as you're changing, God's saying, I want to change you. I want to work in and through you. And it was for me in seventh and eighth grade that God got a hold of my life and said, I want to do this work in you. And you know what? In seventh and eighth grade, God, we, we talked about Team 20. God said, I want, you to, I want you to go to that. And I want to teach you about your identity in Christ and that you have a place to belong and that you have a purpose. In seventh grade, I heard from God and through my youth pastors that I have a purpose for my life. And it was amazing. And so that's our heart for you. Let's go to verse 14. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. You ready? Check this out. Out of all the things Paul could have shared with us, right? He's saying, all right, this is how you do it, all right? How do you be more like Christ? Out of everything he could say, what did he say? 
He said, do everything without grumbling, which is complaining, and arguing. So if you want to see God work in your life, check this out. Don't waste your time complaining. Don't waste your time arguing. That's what Paul tells us in his word. You want to see God work in your life? Don't argue. Don't grumble. Don't complain. What's the opposite of grumbling? The opposite of complaining. You ready? For our next point, to have an attitude of gratitude. Right? So how many of you have ever complained? Right? It's hot. It's cold. Right? There's all these different things we complain for. I want to share something that my wife started doing with me about a couple of months ago. And I'm going to be transparent with you all. Right? Because I'm not a perfect man. I'm a sinner saved by grace just like you guys. I, I, have, I have mistakes. Right? I, I sin. So I was a little complaining a little too much. And so my wife one day said, whoa, 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 time out. You're complaining right now. You need to have an attitude of gratitude. And I'm like, what? She said, stop, time out. Give me three things you're thankful for. And I'm like, what? I don't want to share what I'm thankful for right now. I want to, I want to complain. She said, nope, nope, oh, three things, three things, oh, three things that you're thankful for. And I got to share three things that I'm thankful for. So I want to challenge you guys. When you're ready to complain about your parents, right? You guys have some complaints about your parents, right? Your parents aren't perfect, but they love you. They've done a lot for you, right? They give you food, housing. They drive you places, right? Okay, there's a lot to be thankful for. What about when you argue with your sister or brother? Ooh, that's a good one. Man, that is hard to find something you're thankful for for your brother or sister, right? But you know what? You guys can do it, right? What about when you're just not happy? Like, man, I have so much homework today. I don't want to do my homework. Or there's long lines, or it's hot out, I'm sweaty, it's cold, I'm tired. I don't want to go to church. No, I don't want to go to church today. Why do I got to go to church and watch Sean? I don't want to hear Sean's funny jokes, it, or not so funny jokes. Are they funny or not funny? Yeah, they're funny, right? Right? I don't want, I don't want to do that today, right? Up, ah, time out. Whoa, 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 time out. God, here's what I'm thankful for. So I want to challenge you today, all right? Every day this week, write this down. Every day this week, tell God three things you're thankful for. All right? Every day this week, tell God three things you are thankful for. And you can start in your small group with your small group leaders. All right? And maybe you can start by telling your small group leader you are thankful for them. So why does God not want us to complain and argue? Right? Think about that for a moment. Why does God not want us to complain and argue? And I, I want you to go to verse 15. Because it says, so that. Right? So he's saying, I don't want you to complain and argue. And when we read in verse 15, what we're getting ready to read, he says, so that. He's going to give us the reasons why he doesn't want us to. You ready? Check this out. So that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among the, them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not labor in vain. You see, God's word gives us purpose. As you work out your salvation, as you grow in your love for Jesus, because of what he has done for you, you're becoming more like Jesus. Not perfect, right? We sin every day, right? But that's why Jesus died on the cross for our forgiveness. And then we shine as light in a dark world. There's some pretty dark areas around us, right? What you see every day, what you hear, maybe some peer pressures from your friends. Maybe your friends are doing some things that they shouldn't be, and they're asking you to do them. Right? There's, there's these tem temptations that we're feeling. Maybe it's a movie we watched. We're like, oh, that's a little evil. Maybe it's something we see on our phones. Oh, that's definitely evil. Right? There, there's some things that we see that aren't great. And you see a lot. But you are a light. 
because of the spirit that lives in you, you are a light. And he's not telling you to become light. He's saying you are the light because God is in you. So how do we shine? You ready? In, in verse 16, how do we shine as light? By holding firm to the word of life. How do we hold tight to his word? How do we go, you know what, I, I want to hold tight to, to this. I want to, it's, I, I think maybe it's literally, can carry it around and hold it tight, take it with us where we go. But I think it's through trust. I'm going to trust and believe what God's word says to me. And I'm going to obey it. Because I trust it, I'm going to obey God's word. Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path, right? So I'm going to trust and obey God's word because God's word gives us purpose, right? God's word gives us purpose. Now in verse 17 and 18, but even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul's getting ready to lose his life. He, he, he's not sure what's about to happen. He's getting ready to go on trial. He don't know how long he's going to be in prison and what's going to happen. And he does eventually lose his life. But he's saying, I'm happy. I'm full of joy because my life was used for God. And he's asking everyone, rejoice with me. Right? I found purpose in doing and obeying what God has for me. And I want you to rejoice. His life had meaning, and it was worth the investment that he made in the, the Philippian church. So verse 19, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone who looks out for their own interest but not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proven himself because he, as a son with his father, has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things are going with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. What's Paul saying here? That's a lot. That's a, that's a breathful. Jesus is the ultimate example and he had the mind of Christ. Paul is a great example to follow. But he's talking about somebody else now. Timothy is another person who had the mind of Christ, fully surrendered to Jesus. You ready? Here would be my hope and prayer for you. And it says he had proven character. How do you prove your character? And become through trusting and obeying. Paul's sending Timothy to care for them. Sending to see how you're doing. But he says a key verse in 21. Everybody look at verse 21. For everyone looks out for their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. Most of the time, we're so busy, right? We got sports, we got all this stuff, and we're always on our, on our mind, right? Who's always on their mind? I am always on my mind. It's about me, myself, and I. But what Paul is saying is, Timothy wasn't. He was considering other people. And we want to do that. But the heart is that we're taking time. It's okay to have time to yourself, but the heart here that he's saying about Timothy, he took time to think about other people. When's the last time you took some time to think about other people or to give up some of your time? Maybe it's at lunch where you can take some time to go sit with somebody that's alone, or maybe somebody's having a difficult day. Maybe you can take some time to write a thank you letter or share with them to have an atti attitude of gratitude and share with them why they're thankful. You can give of your words. You can give of your, of writing a letter or taking some time. Take some time to encourage someone or thank them this week. What about the person at the grocery store? Have you ever said thank you to the person at the grocery store? Or maybe thank you to the person at the gas station or thank you to your teacher. When's the last time you guys said thank you to your teacher? Right? That's what he's saying about Timothy. All right. That's what Paul was saying about Timothy. Paul was saying about Timothy, he took time to care for others. Let's go to verse 25 and 30. But I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. Everybody say Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus. One more time. 
Epaphroditus. Say it, everybody. My brother, co-work, fellow soldier who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. Verse 26. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you, you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him. Not only on him, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Epaphroditus, I can barely say it. Say it with me one more time, Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus. All right. He was committed to the go- oops. He was committed to the gospel. He he lived his life to serve Jesus. Imagine that. You commit your life to the gospel to live your life to serve Jesus. He was sent to help Paul and to give him some money to support him. He got sick, but God had mercy on him. His commitment to Christ and others. He made this commitment to Jesus and this commitment to serve others. And that's the last point that we want to share today. Others. Others. There's a story that a missionary, Salvation Army, they sent missionaries all over the world. And the leader of the Salvation Army, he wanted to, he wanted to tell the missionaries one thing. He wanted to tell them a lot, but he only had money to tell them one thing. Right, to send this message. He only had enough money to tell the missionaries one thing. So he prayed, he read the scriptures, and he goes, what is one thing I could tell every missionary to inspire him? I only got one, enough money for one word. And guess what he shared with them? Others. Let's strive to have the mind of Christ by serving others. And here's why. Because it's God who's working in you. It's God, in verse 13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. God is working in you to give you purpose. And so tonight as we close, I want to share with you, think about others this week. How can you serve them? Because, right, Timothy was sent to help Paul. Epaphroditus was sent to help Paul because the people back in the Philip. Philippian church could not go. Just like us, we can't go all over the world right now. But you know what? We can help others. We can help our friends at lunch. We can help our parents, our siblings, our neighbor. Right? God wants to use your life for his glory. And here's one other way we can help. This is a really cool way. You see, here's a Samaritan sh- uh, purse shoebox. There's kids all over the world that don't get any gifts. You remember the present? right, in your Christmas presents, there's kids all over the world that don't get anything. They don't have anything. And a way you can serve others is by going to the dollar store, right, getting a shoebox and filling it with some cool things. There's a football in here. There's crayons. There's sandals. Like, literally, how many of you have a pair of sandals or shoes on? There's kids around the world that don't have this. And God is saying, I've got a purpose for your life, and I want to use you to impact other people. And so uh, pray with me.